Okay. Welcome to our work session. Um, I did want to note that Councillor Kosrobati is absent today, an excused absence, as we say. Um, and uh, we have two items on our work session agenda. The first one being an update on Coho Point project, um, and uh, that'll be kicked off by Joseph Brillio, our Community Development Director, and Mandy Bird, I see is on Zoom, our Development Project Manager. Great, thanks Mayor, Hi, Councilors. Good to be here in this afternoon work session. Uh, today we are here with, or we're joined with our development partner, Black Rock Development, or Real Estate and Development. Uh, Mr. Fareed Bilari and Alan Jones, as architects, are here to provide two things. One is an introduction because most of you are new. I think only the mayor has probably had experience at the beginning of this project, and most of you probably have never met Fareed. So number one is introduction, get to know each other, ask questions. Um, this is again, our the, the selected developer for Coho Point. So we are, we do have a working relationship. Um, and so therefore it's good to know each other. And the second part is to receive an update of what's been going on. What's, what's been the last couple of years of work as you probably have, as you, I know you all know is there's been some delays. Things have taken a little bit longer um, so we're just going to provide some updates there and what you're going to see as well as just an overview. I don't know how intimate um, of an overview that we'll get into, but at least see the project again, see where it's been, where it is, where it's going. We're going to talk about due diligence, um, which I know you're all familiar with now, but where we are, at least there's been extensions and that we're going to have to have another extension. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, but with that, I'll invite Fareed and Alan up to the table to provide an overview and an update and answer any questions. Hello, everyone. That like. You need to use these arrows back. Gotcha. Okay, great. Hello. Yourself. Hello everyone, my name is Fareed Balouri and, uh, and I'm part of the BlackRock Real Estate and Development Company. Uh, we were awarded this project about, I believe, five years ago uh, out of 17 different developers and we were the lucky chosen one. So here we are in front of you, we've been working on this project for a long time. It's not an easy project, it's complicated because of the location, the fact that it's in the floodplains. Uh, the, uh, the FEMA had a different parameters for the floodplains in 1996, or was it a 100-year flood? But we did have the flood of 1996 kind of change the parameter a little bit. Uh, some of you might also know I'm, I'm a local guy. I have a, I'm a dentist. I've been practicing for 31, 31 years, and I think 29 of it has been in Milwaukee. My previous location was at the corner of Maine and Washington. And last September, we moved our office into a Milwaukee Marketplace. So we vacated the building for, for this project. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Alan Jones is our lead architect with Jones Architects, and he'll give you a presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm Alan Jones. Um, as Freed mentioned, we, we started this project together. Um, we helped Freed respond to the RFP. Um, I'm going to go through a few slides that show the history of the project at kind of a high level. Um, you can ask questions about any of that, but I'll, I'll give you an introduction to the project, all of its components, and then go through um, some bullet points that explain what's been happening in the last couple of years, um, as well as a schedule moving forward. Um, so here's a rendering of the project. It's a, it's a six story building on the, on the corner of Maine and Washington. Um, there's a, a bit of a timeline here that I, I can run through. I'll, I'll go quickly. I think a lot of you probably know some history on it, but I just wanted to have this here just in case. So, um, the selection process RFP was in 2017. Um, we went through a series of neighborhood meetings, including a DLC um, presentation in 2019. Um, 
there was city council meeting um, 2019 where the project was, I don't remember all of the details of that project um, or, or that meeting, but the, generally the, the project was approved to go forward um, at that point um, based on its configuration. Um, you know, through the winter of 2019 where the NDA meeting um, met, there was a, a grand opening down in the in downtown on the on the plaza. Um, you know, skipping forward to 2021, um, the land use application was deemed complete. Um, went through DLC hearings. Um, you know, was approved by design commission in the fall of 2021, and then currently, what's in, indicated in green is we're working through the Clomar application. Um, with the city and our, our civil engineers and um, wetland consultants put that package together and I'll show you the timeline on that, but that will be submitted um, very soon. So just a site plan that indicates kind of all of the components that are either part of the project or are directly adjacent to the project. Um, the building is shown on the left on the corner of Maine and Washington. Um, it's a what I, we would describe as a kind of a full donut or courtyard shaped building where the building wraps all the way around a central courtyard. Um, you know, the idea is that it's providing as much housing as it can, as it possibly can. It's a mixed use building with, um, you know, retail on the ground level. There's a shared parking garage in the basement, and then there's um, housing on the upper levels that includes some, some affordable housing. Um, and retail on the ground level is just on the main street side. It's primarily on, I can show you the plan of how that works, oh, okay. but it's primarily focused on main street, okay. but it, but it wraps on both corners and then opens up to the, the public plaza. And I also just wanted to clarify when you say affordable housing, you mean workforce housing that we've been negotiating, or is it actually affordable housing that you all are at 60% AMI or below? So we've been uh, we've been negotiating with the city regarding the affordable housing, and uh, it's been been back and forth. So. So just so councilors know, we're talking about okay. Thanks. Is it it's, it's it's actually um, eighty percent. So, yeah, eighty percent. Okay. So it's it's considered affordable housing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are improvements to the what's known as the Adam Street right of way, which is a, a right of way that was never developed, that there's there's public improvements on that portion. Um, there is a direct connection to Dogwood Park. There will be some rehabilitation of Dogwood Park. Um, there's a pedestrian path that leads from kind of the tabletop or the farmer's market area um, on Main Street um, down along the uh, Kellogg Creek and um, parking under the structure, as I mentioned, and then, you know, obviously there's proximity to public transit. Um, some more specific facts about the project, the, the building includes 185,000 square feet. There are 195 apartment units, um, 81 parking spaces below ground, uh, 237 bike stalls, and then the bike path that I mentioned. Um, Primary entrance for the lobby is off of Main Street. The entrance to the garage, the shared use garage is off of Washington. And then the retail, the, the red arrows indicate the entrances to the possible future retail locations. Again, a rendering of the project. Um, it's broken down into you know, smaller modules, it's a, you know, it's a full block long. So the strategy with architecture was to kind of break it down into individual sections with alternating colors of white and charcoal brick. And then to pull the scale of the building down, um, there's a, what we would describe as like a penthouse articulation where the cladding changes on the upper levels to help bring the cornice line of the project down. And so a view from, from Main Street showing the cornice line stepping down into the four and five story sections, and then the penthouse language on the upper levels. And then you can see the retail storefronts um, along the ground, as well as the lobby entrance, which is shown second from the left in the charcoal section. 
a view from Washington, um, showing the corner retail space on the left, the entrance to the parking garage, and then the building stepping down the slope where the parking garage starts to emerge. Um, the strategy with the parking garage is to push it back at, enough to have landscaping that fully wraps around it and to have kind of metal screens that allow vegetation to grow on them to kind of minimize the impact of the parking garage on the street. So here's the plan of the basement. Again, 81 parking stalls. There is room for a small bike room on the corner of McLaughlin and, and Washington. The ground level with the orange space is shown, or this, the retail space is shown in orange. The lobby and the residential area, common areas are shown in yellow, and then the residential units um, wrap around the back of the building in green. And then I'll kind of go quickly through these, but it's the residential levels um, are very similar in that they wrap around a courtyard. And as you get up into the fourth, fifth, and sixth stories, they start to step away. The building kind of breaks down on the riverside to provide views. So the idea is that the kind of massing steps down the hill. So a view of the building um, from McLaughlin, the riverside, kind of showing how the, the nature of the architecture changes um, from a more urban building, kind of with brick facades and smaller openings on the street to kind of a looser, more contemporary version that steps down and opens up towards the river. Um, you can see what we call the wall here, which is along the walkway, um, which is part of what the civil engineers have been working on right now. It's part of the strategy of a cut and fill um, that we're working with FEMA and um, that's part of the FEMA application right now is a, is a relocation of the wetland. Um, and so this is a kind of a brief bullet point list uh, of the activity going back um, to September of 2021. So as I mentioned, that's when the land use approval or um, entitlements were approved. Um, following that, the following June, um, as, as the project developed, um, the initial application for the FEMA process, which is called the, in this case, we submitted a, a CLOMAR F, which is a more simplified process. That was something that had been previously discussed. Um, there were comments on that from the city. We then turned around in August and submitted the complete CLOMAR F application. Um, at that time, there were, um, different interpretations of whether a Clomar F or a full blown Clomar, which is a more complicated process that takes longer with FEMA and also requires more prerequisite requirements to be done. So at that point, um, that determination came in October. At that point, the project, I would say, had to go back and complete some more, some more engineering. Um, since last October, we've been putting the, the details together of the, the full CLOMAR package, and um, we believe that that is ready to submit this coming week. Um, so a couple more bullet points here. Um, the CLOMAR approval, in order to kind of complete due diligence here, the CLOMAR approval from FEMA, including identify cut bill balance um, of where that needs to go, needs to be determined. I think there needs to be easements that are worked out for where the cut and fill goes exactly. Um, and then there are a list of items here that are, you know, we listed as due diligence activities that are things that Farid and the city have been working on together, um, you know, including the affordable covenant. Um, you know, I think there are, there are comments that have been provided to the city. There's a memorandum of understanding of um, the farmer's market, um, the events. Um, I think that the read and development team would need to provide comments there. Um, similarly, the parking agreement needs to be worked out. Um, the parties are agreeing on the, the affordable housing covenant, uh, memorandum of understanding for the events. And then um, Freed's also applied for a vertical housing development bonus and then there was determination with Boley that was um, was made 
that Freed could give an update on if you guys wanted to talk about that. Um, with that, we can answer questions, but in order, because of the timeline that I've, that I've mentioned there, the, the DDA um, agreement or the period needs to be extended. Um, I think Freed, you're proposing to go to March 31st on that of 2024. Um, the land use entitlement um, package or approval, and Justin could speak to this, but um, we believe that that's expiring in September or October of this year. And so we're requesting a 12 month extension of that as well. Um, if all of, given all of that, given the FEMA process, given the extension requests um, go forward, then here's a brief um, bullet point schedule moving forward. So as I mentioned, the, the CLOMAR application is ready to submit um, in February. Um, I think that the city then reviews that. I think there's a letter of community acknowledgement that goes with it that would go to FEMA in March. Um, what we understand from FEMA is that within a couple months of, of receiving the application, they're likely to um, respond with comments that would indicate um, you know, how they're, how they're going to view the project and, you know, how quickly it'll be approved and would at that point give Fareed and the development team a level of confidence that the, it's safe to move forward with the project. Um, given, you know, that feedback in May, then um, the development team, design engineering team would then move forward um, as quickly as possible with construction documents and the permit application for the building. Um, we're proposing a December um, end of this year permit submittal. Um, and then the other items here are just, you know, based on how quickly the permit application gets reviewed and approved by the city. But, you know, we were anticipating that that could be handled in, in three months, um, as indicated previously, that it would be approved fairly quickly by the city. So this is showing the city issuing the building permit in March of 24. Um, start of construction would be immediate. And then um, it's approximately a two and a half year long construction project. So I know I went quickly over a lot of information there, but that's the kind of the high level and happy to, happy to back up and look at anything in more detail that you'd like to. Are there any questions? Seeing no questions, I'm actually, could you back up to the slide that showed the walkway and the wall? Yeah. That, that one or the, the rendering? The rendering, I guess. Yeah, the, we're, let's see. Yeah, okay. So um, I didn't realize, I mean, I w had w always wondered what, how, what was happening with Dogwood Park, because we knew there was going to be some um, cut and fill from there, but I didn't realize it was that kind of scale of a drop. Um, that, one, that one is news to me. Um, and I guess my question is really one more for staff. Um, just that, you know, if this goes to construction in 24 and we start removing the dam in 25, <laughs> or 26. Could get real messy down Does there. that change this? Because this walkway is intended to go under with the dam, right? It is to connect to what goes, no? No, no it comes down onto the sidewalk and then there's a sidewalk that would lead to the dam. But okay. right now, the directionality is that they were only covering it to basically McLaughlin even. Well, and I can certainly understand why it started that way, because the dam removal would seem pretty far out at the time. But things are looking a little different now. So I just wondered how that changes any thinking. Yeah, it's it, not much, to be quite frank, just because they're going through the, the FEMA Clomer process right now, which will revise the map, Ooh. the floodplain map down there. Um, and it's hard to do a, any kind of review of something that is yet to be 
come to fruition. You know, we know it's coming, but we don't know what it, yet it will look like. So it's hard to design around so right. many variables, right. I guess. But a good question. And so this bubbly thing at the bottom is the water now? That's where the water... I, I, you'll have to forget rendering. the quality of the <laughs> factor in there. Right? That's obviously not the way that it looks. That's not the way that it's intended yeah. to look necessarily. Um, but is that like at high water? Is that... I think there's some Is liberties kind of taking with the with the rendering. Okay. I, I, yeah, you wouldn't read too no, much into that. No. Okay, okay. Um, okay. If I may, yeah. So, um, well, two questions. Are, are you aware of the issues going on with the Kellogg Dam, the movement with the Kellogg Dam? Name of the project. Yeah. Well, actually, the last time we talked to the city it was a project that. They were looking at the next 20 to 25 years. Yeah. Uh, when the city asked to go to a full Clomar, I had a feeling something's coming. <laughs> okay. No, we have yeah. we've had no discussion whatsoever. Uh, it's news to me that it's going to happen in 25 or 26. So we don't have years yet. Um, and to be fair, we actually, when we asked for the full Clomar, we didn't know it was happening. Uh, it was that we're trying to make sure that we're being really smart and intentional about the water and, and the possible incursion into that space. Um, so I just want to make sure you know that th they're actually unrelated in that sense. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I think the civil engineers are, are aware of it. Um, I, I, I can't speak to the engineering as the, maybe to, maybe to fully respond to you, but I, one of the things that you said was I didn't understand the degree of the cut. Um, one thing to point out here is that there, it's, it's cut and fill. It's a, there's a lot of fill. Um, the elevation, like throughout the project, the, the elevation of the garage was evaluated several times and we originally designed to the 100 year bloodline. And then the city asked us to kind of back up and change that criteria and design to the 96 flood line. So, so we, so the, the, so the garage is, is above that line, um, which, you know, is not considered the habitable store, you know, elevation of the building. Um, so the parking level is above the 96 line. And then the habitable stories, the ground story of the building is then another 11 feet above that. And we've, had lots of conversations about locating gear and electrical equipment and what's safe to go in the garage. And, you know, there, there is some anticipation that the garage it could get wet someday. A lot of the buildings in the South waterfront in Portland are designed in a similar way. There's no electrical gear located in the lower levels or the parking levels. There's just a it's kind of a decision that, that has to be made for, for parking, but I understand your point, and I think we'll definitely speak with the civil engineers about it again. Yeah, as the as the city manager said, there's a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. about this. It's just that there's at some point there's going to be we expect, you know, a complicated project to be going on near your property, and that may very well be after your property is complete. But we don't know that for a fact, and I just think it behooves us to stay plugged in. My second question is. Uh, I understand that, that this is a project has taken some time. I understand about the, uh, um, the issues with, uh, you know, the more stringent Clomar and everything like that. Have there been other hurdles that have, that have delayed the project? I was on the planning commission and I saw this project, uh, you know, it seemed like forever ago. So <laughs> sometimes are there other, are there, are there other issues affecting the project? Well, there was a pandemic and that, you know, <laughs> heard about that one. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, and I honestly, I'm not, I'm, I'm not joking necessarily about that. It, it, it changed the speed of which everything gets done, including the design and engineering of, of projects and, you know, the, the speed at which people kind of contemplate and taking, pushing forward with development. So I, I think that's real. Um, but no, the Clomar process is essentially been the driving, driving the timeline. And, you know, we've definitely had a significant backup when there was an interpretation um, change and, and the type of process that it needed to go through. Yeah, thank you. I had two questions. You just answered one of them. 
because I'm guessing 2024 wasn't the original construction date and this thing of a pandemic happened. So um, my other question is, is, are you worried about funding at all? Because I know like with inflation and building materials and all that, it, is that a concern? I mean, it's got to be. A good it's always a concern, concern. especially yeah, yeah. with the interest rates going up. Uh, there are different avenues on this on a project of this size uh, that I'm looking into it. Uh, not to go into too much detail, but there, you know, there are private investors who could be interested in this, and there are also other avenues like insurance companies and things like that, just because of the quality and the size, it's something that institutional other than banks would be interested. But we're hoping for lower interest rates. I don't think the cost is going to come down. Yeah. Interest rate. Okay. You have um, just a couple questions. You went through the number of um, housing units that yes. are there, but I don't remember if you said commercial units, how many commercial tenants are you expecting? I think we have a total of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, I think we have a total of 6,600 square feet of commercial. A uh, number of tenants, I can't tell you. The way we usually design the, these are, they're wide open, they're just shell. And then, uh, you know, interesting parties will come along and say, you know, I need 1,500, I need 2,000 or something like that. Okay. Obviously, we have a few entrances, so, uh, you know, we are hoping for the bottom, the future restaurant at the bottom to be able to put a restaurant in there. Uh, but, you know, we are a few years out, so it's, sure. it's hard to say. That may it's change hard. too. <laughs> sure. <I> change. <laughs> um, do you have within your model um, any flexibility that you have built in? Like, say the project does end up being a lot more expensive. Are there changes to the number of units or number of bedrooms in each unit? What, what I mean, I realize you won't be able to um, forecast everything, but are there certain contingencies that you have in place should the financing change? Uh, if the financing changes, uh, I don't think the number of units or the number of bedrooms are going to be something that we're looking to change because, you know, the plans are set. If we're going to go into construction, that's the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, If the cost goes up, so does the price of rent, I think. I mean, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see. I mean, there are contingencies. Uh, the main contingency would be if interesting institutions want to finance it is they would want more equity. Mm -hmm. More okay. equity from, from the developer usually offsets the cost. Thank you. I noticed that there are, um, on your drawings, there are, solar panels on the roof. It, did you get a floor of height because of green building? Okay. And what's the green building standard you're using? Well, I, th I think we're still looking at um, okay. several options. There's, we've considered um, path to net zero and also lead. And I, I don't I don't know which one of those will prevail at this point, but um, the idea with the solar panels that are shown is that they're powering some aspect of the common area of the building. Um, looking closely at the exterior envelope on the building, making it highly efficient with insulation, um, the right kind of glazing. Um, there's lots of changes that have happened with the building code, with the energy code since this project was started. Um, so it's it's all evolving. You know, the, the state of Oregon energy code is it's pretty advanced actually now in terms of its requirements. So I, I think as we get going into construction documents, we'll have to have a fresh look at, at what's required. And then also, you know, the, the green programs and how they relate to the base code mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm. Other questions, anyone? All right. So the question that you're putting to us is. Well, this is, this is all good. I have really ex excellent questions from all of you. Um, staff is gonna move forward with an extension. Uh, and if there's any feedback, 24, it looks like 12 months is being proposed. So next March, 2024. For the land use approval. Well, that as well, but for the DD, yeah, DDA. Um, so 
we're going to keep moving forward unless there's concerns, questions, or other comments. Um, I mean, we've seen other projects that even don't have these complications dragging out. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think personally, I think it's not unrealistic. Yeah. Again, the part of the part of this is to really introduce our development partner with four. Well, unfortunately, uh, Councillor Kazerbadi can't be here tonight. But um, you know, four of the five are brand new. So, get to meet our our partner. Mm -hmm. In crime. <laughs> <laughs> or in housing. That sounds better. Good trip. But that's it. I and mean, there's nothing else um, pressing. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys for Appreciate coming it. in. Thank you. All right. And our second item on our agenda today is psilocybin code amendments. Uh, again, Community Development Director Brulio, uh, Laura Weigel, our planning manager, and Vera Colius, our senior planner. Sorry. There. Okay. Mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> From housing to mushrooms. <laughs> Isn't it fun to be a planner? It is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. Um, Vera Coley, senior planner, here with the planning manager, Laura Weigel, to uh, talk about psilocybin code. Um, and see if it's something that the council wants to pursue uh, for the city. All right. So in November of 2020, um, Oregon voters passed ballot measure 109, the Oregon Psilocybin Service Act, um, which allows for the manufacture, delivery, and administration of psilocybin mushrooms at licensed facilities. Uh, the measure allows folks that are 21 and over um, to use psilocybin at a licensed facility under the supervision of a licensed facilitator or guide. I think they're calling them trip guides. <laughs> anyway. um, the Oregon Health Authority began accepting applications uh, for licensing in January, and we have received some interest, so that's why we're here today trying to, um, I guess we're not getting ahead of it because it's already happened, but we're seeing if we can, if there's anything that the council would like to, us to do about it. Um, so as far as the way the state law is written, the city has a couple of options. Um, the city could prohibit licensed manufacturers or service, uh, service centers. That requires a vote at an election. So that would be a ballot measure on the election. That's something that in November of 2022, um, a number of communities in Clackamas County put ballot measures on. So Clackamas County opted out of allowing um, psilocybin facilities, um, as well as Estacada, uh, Sandy, and Malala. So those are the three communities plus the county. So unincorporated Clackamas County areas. Would and Happy be. Valley didn't have it on. No one else had any. So everyone else is considered a state Happy haven um, within the county. Yeah. And there wasn't a, I thought you had to have put it forward to an election by last year. If you were going to prohibit. If you were going to prohibit. Correct. So we don't really have that option anymore. Um, I actually didn't see that we couldn't move. I could, I can look into that. I, mean, I didn't okay. see that I mean, that was a preclusion for us. Okay. Um, but when I was looking at what the city of Tigard um, mm. was doing and so on, I, they were actually looking at it. Um, I guess it was in August. So, mm. um, but the city of Tigard did not move forward with, um, with any regulations, but Hillsborough um, does have regulations. And I think that there were links to that in this draft report. Um, so barring prohibition um, of the facilities, the city can impose time, place, and manner restrictions, not unlike um, what we have for marijuana uh, retail and manufacturing production facilities. Um, if it's not prohibited, the city has to provide um, Oregon Health Authority with what we call a LUX statement, a land use compatibility statement. So if someone is going to be applying for licensure with the state, um, they need to come to us um, for a sign signatory and sort of an authorization on a LUX form. We get those for um, marijuana facilities. Um, we get those for DMV licensing for, de for dealers as well um, and for hemp 
um, facilities as well. So it's a document that um, the city endorses saying that our local code does not prohibit the use in the zone where it's being um, requested or where it's being licensed, requested for licensure. So there are four types of licenses that OHA will issue um, for a service center. So that's where um, a, a client would go um, for um, the, um, the experience or for the treatment. Um, there's a service facilitator. So that's the licensed facilitator of the treatment, a product manufacturer. So that's the grow facility and then a testing facility um, for those products. I'm sorry, would you, would you sure. go back to that slide? Yeah. So, as a facilitator, is that a person or a place? Correct, it's a person. Okay. The service center is the actual, I'll call it a clinic. Okay. And the facilitator is the- So they're the operator of the center. Correct, okay. they're the licensed professional that goes through the licensing to be able to administer Thank psilocybin. You. Yep. And they don't have to be, do they have to have any medical credential? There is a, um, there is a required licensing um, process. I think it takes about six months. I don't know if you have to have a medical background, but there is a six month, I think is what I was reading about today, okay. um, licensing um, process. Yeah. And it's not inexpensive. What was it like? Ten thousand. Eight to ten thousand dollars for a six month um, training, I think it is, um, is what I was reading today. And I think the Willamette Week had an article about that. Yeah. There are um, restrictions established within the measure itself or within state law. Um, so they will, so psilocybin is not going to be available as a retail product. It's not gonna be available in stores or something that you buy and you take home. Um, so there are some significant differences between this and, and marijuana regulations. Um, it can only be administered in these licensed settings. Um, the, there are locational restrictions for those service centers. The um, state law specifically prohibits them from being in residential zones. Um, and then there are also, I think it's a thousand feet from a school. So there are some of those bound, like those buffer zones as well, but specifically not allowed in, um, in residential zones. Uh, manufacturing or the growing facilities uh, do not have those same locational restrictions, but they cannot be, um, the manufacturing cannot take place outdoors. Um, and I believe there's also a restriction of the growing facility can't be in the same building as a residence. So you could grow on a residential property, but it can't be in the house can't be in the basement. <laughs> you have to actually have a separate building for that. Um, and there, the licensing packet for growing facilities specifically has um, stipulations for um, some security and sort of, sort of the way that's going to happen as well. Um, okay. So we have, planning staff has fielded to date um, two inquiries. One, um, someone was interested in opening a service center um, in our high density residential zone. Um, and they, so they came forward with a Lux form for that. So our zoning um, wouldn't prohibit it from a strict zoning standpoint. We would consider that a clinic like any other medical office and that would be permitted in our high density residential zone, um, but that would be prohibited by state law because it is a residential zone. So um, the Lux form would say, what our, our code says, but they have other hurdles um, when they get to the state licensing standpoint. Um, we did also receive a request for a Lux endorsement for a small um, grow facility um, in our RMD zone. It'll be in a separate structure. I think it's 96 square feet. Um, so in a small shed facility on the residential property. Um, and so we did issue that Lux as a home occupation. Our home oc occupation standards don't are fairly flexible. It's more about performance standards of a residential property. It's not about what kind of business. Um, so we did endorse that Lux form and they will need to go forward with um, all of the state licensing aspects um, for that. Um, one of the things that from a home occupation standpoint, our code specifically does not permit marijuana businesses as home occupations. Um, so I think um, Mayor Beatty, you were asking about kind of what our code says about marijuana businesses in particular. So the home occupation piece of it specifically calls out um, marijuana businesses as not being allowed um, it's, uh, as a home occupation. But we don't say anything about psilocybin, so we did issue that. Well, I mean, okay. 
I know of of a house that is a grow operation. So if it is for <laughs> personal use, that's different. Yeah. What we're specific about it being a commercial yeah. marijuana operation is not permitted as a home occupation. So we would not permit that. If so someone's someone doing is, it under the table that we don't know about, that's... If someone's using a whole house, that, that's not legal under our code. As a commercial operation. Yeah. No. Correct. No. Okay. No. All right. So we had some options. Um, for uh, council to discuss um, about if you wanted to see us or um, look further into referring a ballot question to prohibit the licensed facilities in the city. Um, if you want us to look into code amendments to enact time, place, and manner restrictions for psilocybin facilities, or we could do nothing at this time and rely upon the state code or the state law um, for those locational requirements and licensing requirements that they have for psilocybin facilities. Um, I did, I think I included in the staff report some links to the Hillsborough page for psilocybin facilities and the kinds of things that they've done um, in their ordinance. There is, um, when I was looking at some of the staff reports, um, particularly for Tigard, um, I was talking to their planner about kind of where they were in the process and they ended up pulling um, their code that they were going to do. Um, they specifically talked about um, the belief that um, the psilocybin program will take more time than the marijuana program to get going, that the state restrictions are sufficient um, to regulate um, the psilocybin facilities and that many jurisdictions are not rushing to take any action at this time. And um, as I mentioned, there were the three municipalities plus Clackamas County that opted out, but no one else had anything on the ballot um, in November to, pro to prohibit the facilities. Happy to answer any questions, but that's kind of what, you know, where we are, what we were hoping to um, ask council. Um, our recommendation um, is that we do believe the state regulations are sufficient, that we don't need to move forward with code amendments right now, but certainly happy to hear what you, what questions you might have or what you think you would like us to do. And I also just wanted to call out the police department that we were starting at five. They do have some concerns. Uh, so okay. the chief and uh, Captain Burdick are on their way and they should be here in the next two minutes. So I think if you're okay, uh, we can randomly talk about things for a few minutes, but I'd like to give them a chance just to weigh in before we vote. Thank you. Well, do you want us to hold questions no, till you can start? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Any questions anyone have? I have questions, okay. but here you answered one. I wondered if anybody had already inquired about starting that. Oops. So, um, yeah, that was it. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Anyone else with questions? Not yet. No? Well, I guess I have one, which is, I think you said, I mean, you just said that having a whole house grow of marijuana is contrary to our code, but you then earlier said someone could use a whole house for this, right? No. No? I did not say that. Um, okay. I thought... Cybin grow? No. Yeah. Um, marijuana. Well, no, I mean, you definitely said no to marijuana, but I thought earlier in the conversation you had said they could choose to use a house either as a residence or as a grow, but they couldn't do both in the same. No, you definitely can't do both. That's the state law. It's very specific about not allowing grow facilities within a residential home. Like, so that you you would need to do um, construct a separate structure for the grow facility. Okay. Um, in our residential zones, we allow home occupations. Those are really the only commercial operations we allow in our RMD zone, in our moderate density residential zone. So if someone someone couldn't have just a grow operation on a residential property, that's okay. a commercial use. We wouldn't permit that. The only way to permit a grow facility and in our moder in moderate density residential zone would be as a home occupation. And there are specific standards for that sort of. And so still you, it's functioning as a home. There just might be something happening on the side. If you have a detached garage or if right. you build a shed or right. something. Okay. Correct. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry if I, if I confused that one. Yeah. I no, I appreciate that clarification because that was my concern mm -hmm. really was, um, sort of having whole houses turn into grows and taking more housing out of yeah. the market. You know, just the same concern about Airbnb. Yeah. Yeah. Is he out there? Yeah, start talking about mushrooms. Please. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Vera, yes. I have one more question. Do, sure. we make, do would we see any revenue from this? 
Um, like we get marijuana tax, right? I believe that's true. I don't know all the financial yeah. ins and outs, but I think there's a similar financial aspect, but I can certainly look into that further. I mean, I would guess the quantity, like like you said, it's gonna ramp up slowly. And so the any revenue we see is gonna be pretty minimal for some years, yeah, yeah. Although you never know because, I mean, when we had med medical marijuana, there were doctors who wrote a lot of medical marijuana <laughs> cards. So um, anyway, we uh, welcome Captain Burdick to talk to us about concerns the police department might have about psilocybin. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for letting us participate. And just some concerns. There's a lot we don't know with this. This is new. Um, I think I heard some uh, that there could be some similarities with marijuana. That was some of the issues that we were trying to talk through. Um, if that's the case, this would be a cash business. Um, sometimes that can present some problems. Um, and that's something definitely to consider. Um, I know some of the marijuana dispensaries have had theft issues, burglary issues, robbery issues. Um, our detective unit uh, is investigating a marijuana-related case. There's over $100,000 uh, involved, so it, it can be significant. Um, so I made a few notes. Um, this is a really difficult time for this area. There's a lot of people struggling with substance abuse problems. This could be something that could help a lot of people, but this could also be adding something to possibly addiction related. I don't know enough about mushrooms or psilocybin to know how addictive potentially it could be. Um, how we bring people into the city, um, are we the only city that would be providing this? Would all the cities in the area be providing this? Those can present different sets of problems or issues. Um, let's see. One of the concerns we have too is Oregon Health Authority, they're administering this, but they have basically said, if there's an issue or you have a concern about anything that's illegal, contact your local law enforcement. So we're trying to anticipate or get ahead what could be some potentially issues for us, how we would do enforcement, um, how much staff time that could impact or what kind of workload it could be. Um, part of this would allow for, I believe, the manufacture in the residential areas for people to grow mushrooms. If there's anything like what happened with marijuana, uh, and it is different, um, but I know with marijuana, people were growing uh, several times more than they were allotted. Um, that found its way into the community, into our teenagers, uh, our drivers with impaired driving, and those are all concerns we have that we'd want to try and work through. And so kind of, if I could leave like kind of a point, it would be, are there advantages to maybe seeing how this um, works in neighboring areas for a period of like a year or something to see what happens, what issues come up and potentially that could help us if we decided to move forward with this, um, how we would adopt it what problems we could address maybe on the front end um, or just try and anticipate. Okay, I heard a bunch of different issues in there. I think the one that, um, well, I don't know if you wanna address them or um, the one about, um, I mean, it, it, suggesting that we wait for a year, I think implies that we would go for a ban, put it on the ballot and that, I think our, I actually think our opportunity to do that maybe has gone, but, um, but even if, I, I mean, I guess even if it's still there, is that something we want to do is go for a ban? If we don't go for a ban and we don't go for a code provision to restrict it, then we're allowing it, right? One of the pieces that, um, Captain Burdick brought up to me earlier that I just wanted to bring forward tonight is a concern that if you have residential grow operations, you also have residential burglary. So that was actually one of the bigger concerns. I just wanted to make sure you were internalizing. That's where my head went. Yeah. 
<laughs> like if somebody's growing it in their shed and somebody knows about it and somebody tells someone else and then yeah. and, and, these, about it and these are some of the problems we had with marijuana yeah. uh, before uh, it was made legal and after and that when people have these in their homes and if there's cash involved those create some difficult circumstances. Sometimes. I mean, there are a few differences. I'm not trying to take a position, but marijuana is grown outdoors and has an odor. This one has to be grown indoors. So it won't be that like people are picking up on the odor and identifying it. So it will have to be sort of the example that Councillor Nicodemus mentioned, like yeah. somebody just knows that there's um, psilocybin, you know, that there's mushrooms growing there. The other thing, oh, you said about other communities. So we know that that was, they raised that before you got here. Um, Clackamas County around us has banned it. Okay. So it's banned in the unincorporated Clackamas County, but it's, oh, there we go. <laughs> Those are the communities that have opted out in, Cla in this county. So in Happy Valley, in Gladstone, in Oregon City, and like Oswego, et cetera, it sounds like it is possible. I was worried about that because I thought some of these other east side cities had opted yeah. out, which would mean all the focus was going to be on us. I guess I'm a little less worried now that I know that, you know, these other um, bigger cities haven't opted out. Um, what was the other thing? Can you go through your... Uh just the problems with, yeah, what we discussed. Oh, addictions. Yeah. I don't know if anybody knows about addictions, and I don't know if anybody knows about uh, what kind of background checks are done on folks to get these licenses. There is a criminal background check done. I know that for sure. Yeah. 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 And the other thing, too, is that they can't actually buy it at a facility. They have to actually go to a facility that's been licensed to actually allow people to go to the facility and go through the experience. There aren't retail shops. You can't buy it on the street. So I think Legally. that... Legally. <laughs> uh, so I guess my request is a couple of things, just knowing that we have two different departments who are in different places right now. One is to find out what the ability is to change the time, place, and manner at a future date if we do run into problems. What is the opportunity for changing uh, approvals once they're approved on a land use? Does that make sense? So if you have a property owner, we're seeing the spikes and burglaries in the neighborhood. What is our authorities at that point? Or do we have to wait? Do we have to delay now, see what happens in the surrounding communities, and then adopt a less stringent code? Does that make sense? That's what I'm trying to figure out is where, where do we have to be in order to make sure that we've addressed the concerns of both departments? I don't think we can delay now Oh, sorry. Okay. No, it would be, do we adopt an ordinance now so that you don't allow for this in residential zoning and see what happens in the surrounding areas? If they don't have an issue, do you lift it because you've now seen that there's not a problem? Or if we do allow it, we don't, uh, we don't put any code in and we end up having an issue, what is our authority to place an ordinance at a future date to further restrict it in residential zoning? I think that we could just go back and bear correct me if you think I'm wrong, we would just go back in and act time, location, sure. restriction. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we'd have the same option later. If a, if a state, if the state had already, or we had already provided them a permit. All we did was endorse a Lux form. Okay, so if we've That's endorsed we the Lux form yeah. and that property ends up having issues for the neighborhood, are right. we able to retract okay. that support? Okay. So the I question is, can you, you know, are they grandfathered if they have right. the exactly. permit? Yeah. Yeah, and just making sure that we're giving the PD a chance to look at this, if if that's what you all want. If you're totally open to proceeding today and you're not interested in having any restrictions, that's totally fine too. But I think we just can't give you as much information about what the impact will be. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Just okay. doing some reading, it says that it's not that addictive. It says alcohol is more addictive. I don't know. I mean, I would worry about kids getting their hands on it. No. Somebody's growing it <laughs> in their shed, but yeah. Glenn is actually the person I'd like to talk to. We just haven't had a conversation with him, so I can't answer that tonight. 
I, th I think the state <clears throat> requirements as well, and Vera can probably speak to more detail. The state requirements for the grow facilities are pretty extensive, and they also require the licensee to, I think, re-up their license uh, every year, which is a cost of about ten thousand dollars just for that process. It's an app for all those four categories of license, or, or just I was looking for the specifically clinic. for the grow facility oh, for the grow. because I had the I had a, an applicant in front of me, and I was trying to suss out what. He needed to do, um, and the annual licensure is ten thousand dollars for the grow facility. I wasn't looking at all the other ones because this was the one that was in front of me. Um, and and there's security uh, measures and a variety of other right. aspects that are roped into the the uh, application. Right. So if we issued a lux for this particular property, he still has a mountain to climb in order to be able to actually establish his grow facility, um, and it's a pretty expensive mountain. That doesn't mean that. He's, he's not going to get there or they're not going to get there. But the, the chances of somebody just kind of trying to do this for a profit motive or to do make a, a quick buck selling it on the corner are pretty low. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, At least according to the legislative right. history behind the measure. Okay. It's not going to be like that joint uh, in Portland where the guy was... They were selling it. The shroom shed? Or yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> the line around the corner. Yeah. 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 Um, Councillor Savinjord had some questions. Um, yeah, thanks. Just a couple questions. So you said that there are four types of licenses, service center, service facilitator, product manufacturer, and testing facility. Right. Could you um, tell me a bit more about the notification process through those licensures that come to the city. So, you know, maybe a land use application, maybe a business license as well. Yeah. And then I'm, I guess I'm wondering specifically about the individual facilitator, if they're not operating in a service center that would be permitted in Milwaukee, how do we know about their licensure? Great questions, all of those. I can't answer all of them. Um, I guess what I can tell you is that, so if a service center, um, which we would consider the same as a medical office or a clinic, um, we're going to open in a zone that allows for clinics, which would be basically all of our commercial zones, um, then they would need a business license. But so they would need to submit for that and you know apply for a business license. Um, so. As far as notification, that's what we would get, uh, just like any other business. Um, a medical office or a psilocybin service center would just need to submit their business license for us. Um, product manufacturer um, or a grow facility, if it were, or a processor or testing facility, those would all be considered very similar to any other kind of an industrial processing or testing facility. So they would be permitted in those zones, like the manufacturing zone, the NMIA zone, for example, kind of our commercial industrial um, zones. Again, a um, generally we get inquiries about, is this permitted? You know, um, if they're doing any kind of building permits to get the place up to code for what they need, um, then planning would typically review that from a zoning perspective and then a business license. So okay. that would be kind of the limitation for that. As far as a service facilitator, um, I don't know that we would know that someone was a licensed facilitator. Um, certainly that's a state licensing aspect. So if there were an individual that were in the process right now of getting licensed um, to be a facilitator, I don't know that we would know that. That's those are the only folks that are permitted to work in a licensed service center, um, but we would be relying on the state for okay. that licensing, um, and then we would we would be issuing lux forms, you know, for any one of these uses. Uh, okay. And again, the lux form, all that does is it just verifies that the use is permitted in the zone. That's the only thing we've approved. Um, and to your question, um, Ms. Ober, about the um, if there were an issue with one of these with this property, for example, um, they're subject to our home occupation regulations that are performance standards. So if there were any issues that ran afoul of those performance standards, that property still needs to function as a residential property. That's the primary use of it. This is a very ancillary kind of thing. So if any of the issues were part of that, then we have our code enforcement process that, you know, that Tim goes through, certainly if it's a legal sort of police situation, that's a law enforcement piece. So, I mean, we have some things that we are able to do just to be able to enforce our own regulations on a home occupation like that. We've done that before when folks start doing stuff, signage and 
I don't know other, other kinds of activity and other things that are happening or on a foul of that. Um, but the state is the one who's licensing the actual grow facility itself. All we're doing is endorsing the zoning. That's And if we change the zoning, that wouldn't be a problem at that point. What's allowable in the zoning? Right. So that, yes. So if we were to change the zoning now and basically add and psilocybin mm -hmm. to the language in our home occupation that yeah. precludes um, the marijuana um, commercial operations, um, then generally, if someone has already received the lux, then that stands. I mean, they are already there. We've changed the zoning for everybody going forward. But they are grandfathered in. Yes. Whatever that term. But if Thank they. You don't so it, that that changes the zoning for everyone going forward but if they have to relicense every year right. does that mean we can go back and say okay they're approved for this year but at the end of this year okay. we're withdrawing the lux or something like I don't, that i don't think that's true no. uh, we'd have to research a little bit further yeah. but i think the, the amount of expense incurred in in establishing one of these facilities i don't think it would be on an annual we'd be able to pull the carpet out from under them. So my suspicion is, as long as they meet the requirements uh, and get licensed, that they can continue their license into the future. Um, if they if they halt business, they can't revive their license, I don't think. Right. Or if they come back for a new development, they want to go somewhere else or something like that. And we have code adopted that, that prohibits them. Uh, but my belief, and I say this just with the caveat that we can look further into yeah. it, but my belief would be we wouldn't be able to to pull it on an annual basis based on the lux. So I think that um, what I'm realizing as we're talking, and council can decide tonight if you want to, that you're not interested in adopting anything and you don't want staff moving down this path any further. Um, however, I think that we probably have a couple departments that need to talk a little bit about what they would propose just together. Um, so if you're open to it, I'd actually like to bring this back in say six weeks or eight weeks, just to say this is what this conversation led to. Uh, and you all have a little more information of what we think the proposal should be. So I'm fine with bringing it back. And I will say that I'm, I was kind of, I came in here tonight kind of leaning toward uh, banning it in residential zones. Um, I mean, I was, I'm a little, uh, my concern about that is a little uh, less because of the separate building issue and that the main residence can't be used for it. But it's still, I think the police bring up some good points and that's kind of where I was. Well, and I think my other concern is just, I don't believe this has been done elsewhere in the United States. So I do think that on this one, Oregon is leading a bit. And so I'd like to just make sure that since we can't learn from the experiences of other states, we're, we're thinking about this for a few more minutes. Well, and we can always remove the ban, right? If we ban it in residential areas and then five years or three years, we find out nobody's having a problem, we can always do that. It's harder as just testified to, to go the other way, right? I just wanted to add because somebody asked the question, I do believe that we are still able to refer an ordinance to the voters. Okay. I don't think there's a temporal limitation on our ability to seek okay. that in the 2022 election. Um, I'm just looking at the Oregon Psilocybin Services got local government information website, and it seems to imply that once we pass an ordinance and refer it to the voters, they will cease issuing licenses uh -huh. in that jurisdiction. So that language alone, in just my quick look, tells me that at some point in time, if we were to ever want to pull it now, I don't believe that has any impact on existing facilities. Mm -hmm. Um, who, who have already gone through the process. Right. Are there pieces of information that other council members would like us to have before we have these conversations? I am interested in knowing about the capacity for local regulation and enforcement, and that's beyond MPD. Yep. That's what the responsibility of the Oregon Health Authority is and their capacity statewide, which varies depending on the substance. So. I, I'm interested in learning a little bit more about that. Thank you. You're good? You're good. Okay. I appreciate it. We will be back. Oh, and I, I think the issue that Captain Burdick raised about the cash nature of the business, I'd like to know about that. I mean, I do know there's some work at the state level on creating a bank for the marijuana businesses and maybe, I don't know, maybe psilocybin's different and doesn't need it or maybe... 
Yeah, I mean, maybe because it's clinical, it's gonna pass muster for regular banking. I don't know, it'd be good to know that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so we're about to adjourn our uh, work session. After the work session, council will meet in executive session pursuant to Oregon revised statute 192-662-F to consider information or records that are exempt by law from public inspection. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members of the audience are asked to leave the room. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on or otherwise disclose any of the deliberations or anything said about these subjects during the executive session, except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decision may be made in executive session. At the end of the executive session, we will return to open session and welcome the audience back into the room. Actually, we'll probably break for dinner before we do that, but... Anyway, that's what the script says. <laughs> All right. So we are adjourned. Yeah, just zoom, I'll make sure that.